last lecture in the semester, your last lecture, and then you have your examination. So it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to have our guest lecturer here from Bayer AG. And I will introduce our guest lecturer in the next minutes. First, I want to bring some ideas for strategic leadership. The question is, and we will hear later from our guest lecturer a lot more and a lot more from the practice side, strategic leadership. And the question is, which are important skills to make a strategic leader a great leader? And I bring you here a quote from Mr. Rothschild. Everyone knows Rothschild, big bank here in Frankfurt. And he says, great fortunes are made when cannonballs fall in the harbor, not when violins play in the bathroom. What is he meaning? He meant that more, that the more unpredictable the environment, the greater the opportunity, but only if you have the leadership skills to capitalize on it. So if you have the leadership skills to uh, know this, to see this, what do you think could be a very important leadership skill. You have heard a lot of in our classes before and what is your idea? What do you think? What could be a leadership skill which is necessary to bring the unpredictable in predictable? You have an idea? Um, not, really. not really. Who has really an idea? Yeah, for you. What's your idea? What do you think? Think practically. Uh, good action, we conceptual skills to see the whole strategic here behind the conceptual skills. Yes, very good conceptual skills from our three skills approach from cuts. Very interesting. And another contribution, is there any other idea, not from the approaches, maybe from your personal idea? Any other one? Who has another idea? You, please. I think for conversion from unpredictable to predictable, you need a transformational style of leadership. Idolized influence or something which has full of charisma and goal model and okay. you can transform the unpredictable aspect into the predictable. Yes, idealized leadership ideas. And what's this? what is the, the answer of a research project? I was uh, involved in a research project from the Wharton School in Philadelphia together with a think tank, DSI Decision Strategies International, also from Pennsylvania or Philadelphia. And these people brought their heads together, made a lot of studies and interviewed 20,000 top executives. And they made a survey and they found out there are some very essential skills they think are really important to build up strategic leadership in the company. And to navigate from unknown to known. Skill number one. Skill number one. Anticipate. Skill number one is anticipate. What means anticipate? Anticipate means that you, as a strategic thinking leader, pick up weak signals from both inside and outside the organization. Pick up weak signals. The next question is, what is the leader's activity to perform this better and to improve this skill. What is the leader's activity? What could be the leader's activity? If you think of anticipate. Talk to your customers, suppliers and other partners to understand what? Talk to them to 
understand what? To understand their daily challenges. To understand their daily challenges. You have it here. Anticipate. An important skill from the research project. Another skill. Another skill is challenge. What is challenge? What does it mean for the strategic leader? Only after careful, careful reflection and examination of a problem through many lenses, through many lenses, do strategic leaders take decision actions. First, they are looking through many lenses and then they will take action. And what is the requirement for this behavior from the leader side? This requires patience, courage, and absolutely important, an open mind. We have heard it in our lectures in the last classes. And what is the leader's activity to improve this skill, the skill indicators, if you remember? That the strategic leader encourage debate internal <coughs> by holding safe zones safe zones meetings where open dialogue and conflict are expected and welcomed challenge we have a third very important result from this research project what is the third strategic leadership characteristic it is interpret interpret what does it mean what does it mean for the strategic leader strategic leader need to recognize patterns and he needs or she needs push through ambiguity push through ambiguity and seek or research new insights this is the meaning and what is the and what is the leader's activity to improve these skill step away from the problem maybe go for a walk look at art in a museum put on non-traditional music or and that's my way go for boxing and then you are free-minded and you will promote open mind. Some of you have been in our boxing lesson and I think I heard after this, I know you are open mind. So, interpret. Now we have a fourth one. The fourth big skill the researchers found out is decide. <laughs> decide. That means Strategic leaders must have the courage of their own convictions. Think on transformational leadership. And this is informed, or they are informed by a robust decision process. What is the leader's activity? How can a leader, she or he, improve it? That's very important. Strategic leaders let others know. Let others know where they are in their decision process. Is the leader still seeking for divergent ideas and debate? Or is he or she moving in the direction of a choice, of a decision, of a closure of the problem? Let's decide. We have another one. Another one. Align. Number five. Align. What does it mean? Strategic leaders must be adept at finding common grounds and achieving buy-in among different stakeholders who have disparate views and agendas and successful leadership in this research successful leadership 
depends on proactive communication, trust building, and that's very important, frequent and strong engagement. And what is the leader's activity to improve these skills? Strategic leaders communicate early, not too late, communicate early and often to combat the two most common complaints in an organization. And what are the two most common complaints in an organization? Number one, no one ever asked me. Number two, no one ever told me. Why be out with this advice and this recommendation? That means align. And we have a sixth one, and we will have a seventh one from military. Now we want to go at the sixth one. It is learn. The sixth one is learn. That means strategic leaders promote culture and study papers. Their own from their own and from their teams. Own and teams. In an open, constructive way to open, to constructive way to find the hidden lessons. What is the leader's activity to improve these skills? Identify initiatives that are not producing as expected problem and examine the root causes. Learn. And now we have a seventh one. We have a seventh one. And the seventh one is from military. And that is, I have discussed with my friends and partners from West Point Military Academy last year, and they say an additional skill to these six important skills from Wharton, Pennsylvania, is that you, as a leader, convey strategic intent. And that means make the objectives very clear, but, and that's very important, but avoid micromanaging those people who will execute on them. That means, in this case, and in this case for me it's military leadership, private leadership, is very, very narrow combined. That means Strategic leaders, <coughs> military or business or private, strategic leaders communicate what must be done, but giving the freedom to decide how to do it, both in military and in private. So, now I want to introduce our guest lecturer from today. A big welcome to Peter Müller. He is the Senior Vice President of Finance from Bayer AG, Leverkusen, Germany. And he gives us a lecture about strategic leadership in the finance department in the multinational global acting company. I will give some facts from his short bio. Peter Müller joined Bayer AG as commercial trainee in 1979 and spent two years in corporate auditing thereafter. He moved then to Japan, where he worked for seven years with three Bayer subsidiaries in the field of finance and accounting. After further three years at German Bayer headquarters in central controlling, Peter Müller became deputy general manager of Bayer's newly founded holding company in Beijing, China. In the following five years, he established the administrative country platform and helped to negotiate and finance 12 joint venture companies. Mr. Müller joined the finance division, division at Bayer AG as head of corporate financial controlling in 1999 
before being appointed head of corporate finance 2002 and now head of finance in summer 2011. Mr. Miller, a great welcome to Goethe University, a great welcome in the name of the House of Finance and also in my name in the Goethe Finance Association. It's a big pleasure and it's an honor for us that you are giving you the best lecture here. A big welcome. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me today. Normally I'm not used uh, to speak in such a large room without mic, so I hope you can hear me at the back. Please remind me if, uh, if that's not the case. So, um, so, um, strategic leadership in the finance department of a global acting company um, is a very long title Professor Kummer gave me and therefore I try to slice it a bit. And first of all, and I'm sorry that you have to look now at this side, but I hope you can see it from here. First of all, I would briefly introduce Bayer as a global acting company. And uh, most of you might know, and I hope you sometimes use it, this product, Aspirin, which next year celebrates its 120th birthday, but still is a growing product, generating about 1 billion euro in sales. So our business is life science, and that uh, consists of so-called uh, over-the-counter or non-prescription medicines, colleagues from the US, if you are here, some are here might know Alka Selsa. It's also in carnival season very popular if you have a hangover. Um, a leaf is something against pain and so on. Then we have, of course, prescription drugs, which is our big, biggest business uh, area, um, which is yeah, consisting of brands more known to physicians, maybe not to you. Then we have a very small animal health business. Um, this is a product which people use against ticks and fleas at cats and dogs. And uh, we have then a crop science business with seeds and pesticides for farmers. So in total, our sales last year, uh, last year is for me still 2014, I'm sorry, um, because 2015 is not yet published. Um, we're at 42.2 billion euro. This year, because it's a weak euro, it will be more than 46 billion. And we have generated 9 billion euro in adjusted EBITDA. Does everybody know what EBITDA is? Who does not? You know it? Yeah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Earnings before interest and tax and uh, depreciation amortization. So, um, are you happy question? Oh, no, I'm not. No, okay. So, um, we are a truly global company, I think, because we have 119,000 employees in 302 consolidated subsidiaries in more than 180 countries in the world. And we spent in the yeah, 2014, we spent 6 billion euro for our future, so either for investment in capital expenditures or for R&D. And last but not least, we were last end of last year the most valuable company in the German DAX stock index with a market cap of about 100 billion euro. Market cap is number of shares times stock price. And uh, thus we were ahead of companies like Siemens, SAP, or Volkswagen. So, so far to a global company, now coming to the aspect of leadership. And uh, here I would like to ask you, what do you think makes up a good leader? So, some of you might have had internships. Um, yeah, or worked maybe even already. So 
if you think of your bosses you have, what positive aspects could you name the superior should have? I guess in this competitive world, it's the, a good leader has to create a value and sustain it over a longer period of time. So that has to leverage advantage over the competitors. Okay. That's very conceptual. So for you as an employee, it has then the benefit that your workplace is safe, maybe. Yeah. So if you come a little bit closer now to the human interaction you have with your boss. Yeah. From my personal experience, I found it very important um, to communicate the, the right communication. I think that okay. the right communication is very important and also um, to know when to delegate. When okay. person, um, obviously, obviously uh, one uh, knows what to do and uh, wants to work um, that the manager or uh, the leader yeah. gives yeah. the person yeah. the responsibility to yeah. do. I think that's also something Professor Trummer mentioned, uh, communication, I think he mentioned, and also define the strategy but don't implement it. So let people the f have the freedom to, to find their way. Person who was a very nice person but totally incompetent. 
and then it's very hard to respect uh, those um, superiors. So uh, technical competence in theory and in practice is of course also required. Then, um, very important in nowadays world, and uh, that was uh, also mentioned by Professor Trummer, so to build these alliances, um, uh, people should think in a strategic and, and entrepreneurial way, so they should not think in, their, in the silos of their department. Unfortunately, in a, in a global company like Bayer, you have still this silo thinking sometimes, so people don't act in the interest of the, of the corporation, but just in, in the interest of their own area. <coughs> then, um, I think a good superior should be able to set the right targets, which should also be achievable. So I've seen superiors which like this concept of aspirational targets. These are targets you're never able to reach. That is quite frustrating um, if people um, always try hard but never reach a goal. So um, very important to set ambitious targets, but they should also be reasonable. And of course, the superior has to prioritize. So if he sees that uh, some employee is overworked, that, that too many things have to be done at the same time. He has also to help and to prioritize. Then, uh, I think it is very important that uh, he or she is empathetic. So, um, in my early days, I had this very autocratic people, which um, led to fear. So. Um, they uh, had no natural authority, but they um, had the authority coming from their title um, or from, let's say, their power to destroy. Yeah. But nowadays, in nowadays world, I think uh, you have to be empathetic, you have to be humane. So um, you have sometimes to talk with your employees also about private matters. You have to care for them if, if they are hospitalized. Yeah. Um, something like that. So you have to think beyond uh, just the work. And I think a uh, good peer should also be a team player. Then I think um, trust, that was also mentioned by Professor Trummer, a good peer should not manage by control, but um, in the first place should trust these people and, um, and delegate. And only, let's say, in cases where he senses something goes wrong, then he has to increase, of course, his, his uh, supervision. But this should not be sending at the beginning. Then, um, I think it is very important that a good superior stands by his team if the team makes a mistake, or if an employee makes a mistake. So, um, everybody makes mistakes, we also heard this is an important thing to become better. Um, you hear sometimes also the concept of celebrate your mistakes or your failures in order to learn from them. Um, and then it's very important that uh, the superior stands in front of his team and defends it and not blames, let's say, the, the problems on, on the individual. So then, I think a good uh, superior should be a good listener and communicator and should provide regular feedback to his employees. By the way, you get all this in writing, so don't have to write anything down. Um, and he, he should or she should give proactively feedback and regular feedback and also ask for feedback on his own leadership style in order to, uh, to improve. Another thing is that uh, he or she should challenge the subordinates, um, so to give them challenging tasks, but also to develop the careers of people. So um, it becomes quite quickly known in the corporation which superior 
um, takes care of people and um, let's say which people coming out of that area make careers and that attracts of course new talent so it is an important aspect also in the interest of the superior himself <coughs> then I think um, I would like my boss to um, be innovative to be curious and to be willing to um, incur calculated, of course, risks, yeah? calculated risks, especially in finance. This is a very important concept. Yeah? Um, so um, that was also, I think, mentioned by Professor Kummer. Yeah, then I think um, a very important point, and I've seen here also bad examples, a good superior admits when he's wrong. So, um, even if, let's say, um, you have walked quite a bit on the road and it, takes, it is painful to return and, and restart, but a good superior should, um, if he realizes, okay, I'm on the wrong way, admit it and correct it. And not um, pretend, let's say, uh, because he is afraid of showing a weakness to, uh, to let's say, push things through to the end. And, um, yeah, finally, for me, a very important aspect is um, a good superior should have a good sense of humor. We come to that later um, if we talk about performance culture. Um, you can already feel, if you come to an organization and people are smiling, laughing, having fun, um, that work um, is performed much better as if you are in an organization where people run around with angry faces and stress and so on. So this is um, yeah, my very personal interpretation of good leadership, but you could add here a lot more. Yeah. Now, let's come to the concept of strategic and if there is strategic, obviously there is also operational. Actually, um, the operational um, tasks um, consume about, yeah, also for me personally, much more than the strategic ones of my time. But I've been asked today to speak about the strategic <coughs> elements, so uh, therefore, I want just to briefly mention uh, the operational ones. It starts with the annual target setting uh, for my staff members. Um, then 85% uh, of my cost, of my organizational cost, are personal expenses. So when it comes to budgeting, um, merit increase, promotions, um, um, people leaving and uh, uh, new hirings, so that is all has to be considered. Then, um, if new jobs are created or if jobs contents are changing, we have to do job descriptions. Those jobs are then evaluated, so we use the hay concept, and based on that, the salary grade is then decided. Then, I have, of course, to do a lot of day-to-day -day support with my staff members. Um, and I have to give them continuous feedback. Then there's the concept of training and mentoring. So um, I have also one or two mentees. These are people from completely different parts of the organization, which I'm, let's say, coaching a bit. And then we have uh, some nice events. Uh, well, retirement, some mostly is not nice. Sometimes it's nice. Uh, if, uh, if you get rid of somebody, but um, anniversaries we celebrate, um, um, promotions and this kind of stuff. So coming now to the strategic um, part, um, I think first of all a good employer should have a mission and should have values and we as a buyer have also competences. Talk. So I will come to that a little more. Then you have to think where do I get good people from? So 
the uh, recruiting and onboard onboarding. After that, um, you have to set your people targets. Then later you have to measure the achievement. You have to incentivize. So we'll have a look at that. Then um, it is very important that you recognize the strengths and weaknesses of your employees and that you think about the right development measures to address that and about the next career steps. So this we do in our development dialogue. Then we have a um, number of instruments um, on training. For example, our Bayer Academy. We have um, the instrument of a 360-degree feedback. I will explain that later in more detail. And we have a number of assessment centers. Then we have a couple of times per year personal and organizational conferences where we discuss career passes, people portfolio, and so on. Come also to the more detail. And last but not least, I would like to mention here the aspect of diversity because it is also one element of our strategic personal planning and development. All these strategic tools and concepts and yeah, elements should lead to one thing and that is a high performance culture. Now I would like to walk with you through each of those aspects. And kindly, if you want to discuss something, if you have an objection or a remark, please raise your hand. You can, uh, it's also more interesting for me if you have a kind of dialogue and I'm not talking now for one hour without interruption. So, <coughs> the mission in case of Bayer is Science for Better Life. So we are an inventor company. We, we have invented a lot of things in our 153 year history. Um, we are proud of that. We are proud of being innovative. And we want to make people's lives better. So that is our mission. And then we have values which we expect each employee to identify him or herself with. And yeah, to find here the bridge to life, we have called them life, leadership, flexi integrity, flexibility, and efficiency. Values must be um, very pregnant, as a not pregnant sense of this, but uh, pregnant in German, I'm not sure whether the must be very precise, yeah, and uh, um, uh, let's say the worker in the factory have to understand it, and the researcher in the lab. So um, therefore, we choose this word "life," which is you can remember easily. And um, then we have detailed it a bit more. That is said, in order to live those values you should have certain competences. And the gentleman in the second row, he mentioned with some you are born, yeah, and some you can learn. Yeah. So you have to find out yourself. Um, we have two sets of competences. We have on the left hand side, you see the core competences, eight core competences, which we say every employee should have and buy us. And here also, Professor Truma mentioned it, ask your customer, so that is a very important concept also for us. Um, we are not producing things and then see how we can sell them. We try to, to uh, find out the problems of our customers and then develop products which serve them. Um, then on the right hand side you see eight leadership competences. This is just for people with management tasks. So who lead other people. And those competences are taken out of a set of 38 competences developed by Corn Ferry. 
Von Perry, you might know, is a, a humorous consultant, like Zehnda, or this kind of people. And uh, they have developed this uh, competency concept, and we have taken out of the 38, because it's a bit heavy, we have taken those 16 we would like our people to um, concentrate on. Do you communicate these competencies um, when you, you know, for new employees? Do you communicate them? I, I guess in the assessment centers um, you would search for these competencies, for the core competencies, but do, you, do the people that So, so you think uh, of if you apply for a job at Bayer, it's maybe good to know it in order that you can prepare for the assessment center. Or in order to know if you will fit in. Yeah. Um, I think if you look at our home page somewhere. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious yeah. because no. I thought maybe that yeah. would be nice. <laughs> As it is not, let's say it is not, um, if an assessment center starts, it is not uh, proactively communicated. Um, but it is also not would not be a secret. Yeah. On the other hand side, I've seen people acting a bit at assessment centers uh, because they have prepared themselves too much, and and then they behave unnat in an unnatural way, and, and that was more harmful. So. Um, yeah, maybe uh, something I can take back and, and uh, introduce to our human resource department. Because generally speaking, I think we should be very transparent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if people apply for a job at buyers, they should know what the company stands for, what our values, what is expected, and whether it, it, it is personal fit. So, once we, this is somehow the ground now we have laid, and now we start hiring the first employees, and we have of course to, to think where do we get, and how do we get the best people. And um, for the finance function, I thought about that, I just uh, looked at our existing people, and, and uh, from thought myself from which sources did they come. And um, first of all, we have our own apprenticeship um, schemes where people after school join and then do a commercial apprenticeship, which is a quite German concept. Um, so we have some of those people. Then we have, of course, here um, people like you who would join as a trainee or maybe as a direct entry. Um, and therefore, we have um, selected some key universities we have a strategic cooperation with. And we have here selected Frankfurt, especially for finance. And that's also why I'm here today, because I want to uh, keep the relationship with the university and with the students, especially for the finance function. We have also partnerships with Cologne, Mannheim, Münster, and in Europe with Maastricht, Tricht, Rotterdam, and St. Gallen. This is for the finance in the wider sense, so including accounting, controlling, tax, and audit. Then, um, we like to have job rotation, so people inside finance changing jobs, or inside the wider community with accounting, controlling, audit, changing jobs, or even with our operational divisions. So we have also people from uh, pharmaceutical controllers also who have joined us. Then we have a large pool um, of people which we can develop, which are our country CFOs. So I showed that we have 302 consolidated subsidiaries. Not each of them has a CFO because we have also country groups. But we have a large number of good people there. Then in the larger countries we have even assistance to those CFOs where we can place younger talents. 
And we have, of course, then the operational areas in the country with treasury, with accounting, and so on. So this is also a good pool of people to, um, to look into. Very rarely, I must say, we go by a headhunter. So if we have a specialist uh, job to fill, like a foreign um, exchange manager or a cash manager or so, where we need some very specific know-how, um, we get sometimes, of course, applications from experienced people. Um, and a very valuable source is also recommendations from other finance managers, which I know, for example, as other companies. And finally, because buyer is very active in, in buying and selling businesses, you sometimes get good people if you take over another company and uh, you can incorporate those people in your team. Or unfortunately, sometimes, or they are fortunate maybe for the people because they make a career, you have also to let go with people if you are um, um, separating from a business like we did, for example, with our chemical business last year. So that are sources, strategic sources. Now, once you have the people, and now it gets uh, a bit technical, um, you have to set goals, and uh, for that we have a system. So our HR is quite, let's say, systemized, yeah? and uh, everything is in self-service. So as an employee, you, uh, you sign on the system, and then you have to enter in the red um, circles, I mean business objectives and leadership of objectives. So it is normally expected that you make a proposal by yourself, what you think you should achieve in the next year, send it to the superiors, superior has a look, changes a little bit, adds maybe the one or the other goal, and then finally you agree on it. Then at the beginning of the following year, um, it comes to the question how much and how well did you achieve your targets, how was your performance, and um, how big should be your bonus. So, and here comes uh, German engineering now in place, a bit of over engineering, if you ask me. But there's less, I will explain it to you, and now you have to concentrate, because it's complicated. So, Depending on the management level you are working at, you get a bonus eligible, that is a euro amount, and that is calculated from the fixed income, and that goes from 18%, 1.8% of your annual income, to 100% if you are in the board of management. So the people in the board of management have therefore 100% fixed income, 100% bonus, so they get 200% of everybody else. No, just joking. So they have 50% variable income, 50% fixed. And this bonus eligible amount, which is calculated, is then distributed in three parts, in an individual performance part, in a subgroup performance part, and in a group performance part. The individual third is multiplied with your performance um, achievement factor, let's say. And that you see on the right hand side bottom. So if you have fully meet your, um, met your expectations, which is a bit better than the school, let's say, level, uh, which says satisfactory, as a, you are really, you have perfectly achieved your targets, then you get 100% of that third. If you are a shining star and you have an outstanding performance, then you get 250% of that third. So, a lot of incentive here. If you have not met your expectations, or only partially, you get only 25%. So, quite different. Here. And if you have problematic performance, you get zero. If you have problematic performance, you don't get anything, by the way. Also, the other two buckets uh, are sent multiplied to zero. So then, the subgroup performance is the division you work in. So pharmaceuticals, consumer health, 
agrochemicals or the administration. And here it is judged how this division did achieve the target as a whole. And then that is the multiplier for that second third. And the third third is the performance of buyer as a company, which is measured in earnings per share. So if we are exceeding what we have promised to our investors, then also on that one third, there is um, a top up. If we earn less than we have promised, there is a um, it's multiplied with less. Or more. So, um, yeah, that's the bonus system. It's always for me also great every year to understand it again. Okay. Then, ah, so, and there's an even simpler thing now, and that is we call ESZ. Individual, individuelle Einmalzahlung, which is an individual one-time payment. And there, every department has a budget where I, as a leader, can, let's say, freely decide to pay an employee um, some bonus amount during the year if he or she has successfully completed a project or, let's say, one colleague fell ill and he or she had to take both uh, jobs and had to do a lot of overtime and so on. So for this kind of very specific things, we have also an individual budget, which I personally think is even more valuable because, frankly speaking, the disadvantage of the former system, apart from it that it's extremely complicated, is that everybody who gets a fully needs feels inferior because you can, let's say, Professor Koma might, might agree, you normally um, have more people on the positive side than on the negative side. So you don't have, you never have a normal distribution where the three is in the middle. So always the average is 2.65 or 2.7 or something. And that leads to the fact that people who get this three asked why don't what do I have to do to get a two? Yeah? And people who get a two this year ask why next year, why didn't I get it again? So from my point of view, I'm a bit critical um, because I think also the differentiation is very wide between 100 percent for targets achieved and 250 percent for targets overachieved. So this is an extreme um, Benefits. So now coming to a very important uh, topic which I personally like very much as a strategic leadership instrument and that is the annual development dialogue. So I've just completed that with my direct report. I do it always beginning of the year when I have also a look at the performance management system and at the target achievement of the last year, I'm also talking about the targets for this year and about strengths and weaknesses and the development of the person itself. The first thing I ask, how do you feel? Are you happy? Are you enjoying your work? Because I think that is the most basic thing. Yeah, only if you in the morning come to the company and you feel happy, you, uh, you get up and, and you really like to come to the company and to work, then you can do a, can have a good performance. So, very important question. Then, um, we talk about the strengths and the development areas, we don't call it weakness, yeah, because that's a too negative term, so we call it development areas, but it's weakness. Um, and then um, we talk about the competences, this 16 competence, 8 or 16 depending, which I mentioned before. And here we have a very interesting concept. So first, the employee and the superior separately um, evaluate how the person is seen whether a competency is strong, whether it's, let's say, just for right, or whether it's in development. And then, 
only if both have entered their judgment, both can see the result. And this year, um, we have newly introduced that concept uh, last year, so this year it was for me also the first experience to see, let's say, then side by side how I viewed the person and how the person viewed himself. And luckily, I must say, in 80% of the cases it was identical, which I think speaks for very good um, communication and understanding of each other. Um, but I have a few cases where the employee saw himself in that competency as strong and I saw it as developing. Yeah. And these are then the points you should really address in the development dialogue. There it becomes very valuable that you talk about that. And um, sometimes it's a question of interpretation, but sometimes it's really a question that people see themselves in different um, manner than others so then we talk about the future, so is he or she mobile, let's say willing and ready to move abroad, which is yeah, at least aspire a very important way of making a career. Um, what are the aspirations of the employee? What does he or she want to achieve in the short, in the medium, in the long term? And what could be the possible next career step? Then, uh, depending on the weaknesses or development areas, we discuss development measures, trainings. Then, um, last but not least, I as a superior also ask for feedback of my staff on my leadership style. So, the next aspect in strategic leadership um, is of course training and here we have our own academy, we call it academy um, it is actually a modular system of trainings you see here now you can use this nice pointer which uh, I brought from China so you can shoot planes down with that um, you can see here the leadership part and here's the functional part. So this is, um, we have here in our larger finance community, we have a finance onboarding program, uh, teaching technical aspects for new employees in, in the finance accounting controlling tax. And we have a finance development program where we uh, have, let's say, more advanced managers participating. And then on the leadership, we have, depending on uh, the, the hierarchy level in the company, we have different courses. So these are here compulsory ones, which whenever you are promoted to a certain level, you have to attend. And the green ones, um, you are, let's say, selected if you have a good, shown a good performance. So these are very, very attractive programs, which are also, um, which have been uh, conceptually designed together and are also executed at the site of business schools. So we work, for example, together with Esade in uh, Spain or with IMB in uh, Lausanne and also with Harvard Business School here. Yeah. And maybe in future with Frankfurt, hopefully. So, um, yeah, self awareness is the first step forward. So, 360-degree feedback is a very important and powerful instrument. Do you know what 360-degree what is? Uh, it's an all-round feedback taken generally at a higher level where you get assessed by uh, the people at your own level and people higher at the level and below. Yes, exactly. So, um, it is, uh, as the name says already, looking completely around oneself plus looking at oneself. So in the 360 degree feedback, first I assess myself, my strengths and weaknesses, then I ask my peers, so which are on the same management level like me and that's the same next superior. Then um, I ask colleagues which I interact with regularly, so this could be in my case, for example, the CFOs of larger countries, 
This would be um, yeah, managers of in the divisions or in the corporate center. Um, I could even ask outsiders like uh, um, auditors or so. Then I'm asking my direct reports from my employees and my superiors. So the, the next one and the, the one on top of that. And um, there's a number of questions which focuses again on these competencies. And then later I get a, a feedback picture for myself where I can mirror my own self-assessment against how other people see me. And I get here in this 360 also comments, so verbal comments. Um, some of them are really very rewarding, yeah, if they are positive. Um, some might be a bit hurting, yeah, but um, might be very necessary, so that you, you realize maybe uh, you have to work on something. So. And this 360 is also a good basis, uh, can be a good base for the development dialogue with the um, peer. So and then we have something, um, assessment center, so we don't, we have it of course if we employ newly people, but we have it also um, to develop. Different levels, um, future leader development center is the entry one, and the next one is called um, Leader Development Center, Executive Assessment and Senior Assessment. So, in the Assessment Center, people are, um, let's say, first of all, only people are nominated which are, which are good performers. So, the superior is nominating somebody because he believes that he or she um, could at least make one further step, maybe even two or three. Um, that is very important. So assessment center should not be used uh, to show an employee that his self um, picture is, let's say, uh, that he has the wrong belief in himself and the superior wants to prove that by sending, let's say, a medium performer to such a center. Because then you are really damaging people. So only really good people should be sent there. Then uh, they, are, they are put in a situation which is one or two levels ahead of their current um, leadership environment. And then they are measured how they behave in that, let's say, for them not yet known situations. So they are role plays and so on. Um, personally, I have mixed feelings with regard to assessment centers, I must say, um, because, as I mentioned before, um, first of all, people are, yeah, they are very nervous if they go there. Um, it, is a, it is a high stress situation, it is quite artificial, it depends, let's say, which are the, the other colleagues which are there at the table, how the outcome is. Um, a lot depends, of course, also on the quality of the observers. Yeah. And um, personally, I think if a, if a person has been positively evaluated by different superiors over a longer period of time, I would give that more weight than this one or two day uh, laboratory style examination. And another thing which um, I don't like so much is that I have this feeling that assessment centers, if, if, it is, if there's too much emphasis put on that instrument, that you get one streamlined kind of person um, and the, the very important element of diversity is lost. So maybe two very small anecdotes here from my personal life. Um, one of my bosses in my career was Karl Ludwig Klein, who is the, the CEO of Merck in Darmstadt. And he once told me the story when he was still at pharmaceuticals at Bayer. He had an assessment center on young Chinese um, students, which Bayer was taking on in order to develop them on a, on a leading role in our Chinese organization later. And there was one candidate 
who failed through all of the different uh, tasks in the assessment center. And that has never happened before <laughs> that somebody failed everything completely. And then he said, when he looked at the, at the uh, exams, he said, okay, I just want to know that guy. Yeah, I want to have a look at that person. And then he talked with him 10 minutes and he said, I employ that person. And today he is the CEO of Pfizer in China. Yeah. So, you see, and the other anecdote I can tell you also from, from my uh, personal experience, uh, I had to hire a lot of people in China when we built up our organization and I had once an interview which was the strangest interview I had in my life. Um, the guy came to our company and, and we had a panel of three people and I've never laughed so much during an interview than I did at that time because that guy was so funny. It was totally silly. Yeah. Um, so. Um, asked about the question, why do you apply here at Bayer? He said, well, I've applied already 10 times, but I, I always failed there, yeah, all this kind of thing. And also his father, and, and then we employed him because I told my people, you know, we take on that guy, he creates so much fun in the department, that's already a value in itself. Yeah. <laughs> and he is today, he still with Bayer, and he has made a quite reasonable career. And after we had employed him, I got a, a thank you call from his father and he said, Oh, Mr. Miller, you know, I'm so grateful that you employed my son. I, I thought he would never make it. <laughs> okay, so then we have um, personal and organizational conferences. Um, this is, um, let's say, an institution which uh, takes place by organizational unit, so we have one for finance, we have um, one for accounting and so on. We have um, then one for our greater area and we have one for our group leadership circle. So um, maybe it's, uh, the one and same person is discussed here in, in different, from different angles. And um, those conferences take place once or twice per year. And it's discuss here basic questions around HR policy. For example, this uh, key university concept was developed in this um, conferences. Then we discuss our what we call people portfolio. So we distinguish between high performers or uh, no, we distinguish between high potentials, potentials valued performers, um, reassign and problematic. And uh, potentials, we think, can at least make one further step and high potentials at least two steps. So um, then we, we discuss those, at least the potentials and high potentials person by person. We, we think what could be the next career step, how, how could we develop those people, we do succession planning and so on. Yeah, and um, we here also have the topic of diversity. So um, since a couple of years now, I think it's five, five or six years, we have an um, American Dutch CEO. So that was quite um, a cultural change also for Bayer. Um, our business language is now even in Leverkusen as English in most cases. Um, we have a much, um, let's say, more informal leadership style. And one thing which uh, was our, uh, which our CEO was, let's say, aiming at was to make our management team more international and more diverse. So, talking about diversity, um, I think a diverse team, and I mentioned those, let's say, colorful um, words yeah, before these two examples, that may, may make a team extremely valuable because um, if a team is diverse, you look at problems from completely different angles and therefore you 
become normally also too much better and sustainable solutions and we have also a more balanced view on things. But unfortunately, from my point of view, diversity is um, sometimes limited to those three aspects. Um, very prominently, female-male, um, sometimes uh, nationality, culture, and sometimes age. Why? Because those three elements you can easily measure and recognize. But I think um, diversity goes much further. <coughs> it includes, for example, different personalities. So if you have introvert people and extrovert people in your team, um, you have different working styles. You can see that some people draw first uh, a, a detailed plan, make, make everything, and others just start right away. Yeah. So you need both. Um, then you have people with different career paths coming from different parts of the company and having their network behind them. So this can be a very important element and many more things. So how to measure is very difficult. For the first three it's very easy but um, let's say uh, I'm not sure whether there's uh, Maybe that is some, some question to, to the academia to find here maybe some concept to measure diversity. Um, of course, you should avoid here pitfalls, which I think uh, one I mentioned, the assessment centers, so should not be uh, used to, let's say, get one stereotype kind of person. Um, the other thing I think is uh, yeah, every superior has always to be very careful when he hires that he is not trying to clone himself so that you are hiring people uh, who appear to be like you. Um, and I think um, we should also be careful here um, to establish um, too much quotas or to, to see it as a dogma um, because in some areas like engineering, for example, you have less females because less females study engineering. So that's just, a, let's say, a matter of course. Um, and therefore, I think you have to, uh, to have here um, a sensitive approach. Now, I'm at the end of this list. And uh, if you remember, this was a list on the right-hand side, strategic um, aspects of leadership. And everything should end, or let's say, contribute to a high-performance culture. So what is a high-performance culture? I think, um, yeah, to create a positive work environment, and that includes first clarity in the organization, that everybody knows what is my responsibility, what I am also accountable for, what is my responsibility, what, what I measured against, that you have openness, so open communication, open feedback, also transparency in decisions, that you explain also why you have taken certain decisions, and that you have an environment of trust and delegation, and not of control, and let's say uh, the boss does everything himself. Then, I think a high-performance culture should have a social competent team and also a team which uh, has a good business ex expertise. So, the social and the technical side should be first class. Diversity, I mentioned already, is a very important element of high-performance. Then I think, um, I mentioned it also for the good leadership skills, also, employees should think out of their own boxes, yeah, out of their department, out of their special work, should look left and right, yeah? should try to understand the whole process they are maybe an element of. Um, and um, yeah, then the, the culture of dealing with failures, that means um, failures should uh, yeah, to celebrate that's a bit, you know, consultant language, but 
at least you should accept failures. Yeah. If no, if somebody takes no risk, you, he will not experience or she any failure. Um, but people have to learn from those failures. Yeah. They should not make the same mistake twice or three times again. Of course. Then um, sometimes. You have a very good person, but he or she is just on the wrong job. So as a superior, I always have also looked at that, that aspect. Is the right person in the right place? And then recognition, praise is very important for high performance culture. So um, I've once learned on feedback I should praise nine times and criticize one time. So it should be around that, um, let's say, ratio. Um, and you should recognize good performance. Um, but any group, any organizational unit will not turn into a high performance culture if the unit is not successful. So success is the most important intrinsic factor which motivates people and which makes them proud and which makes them happy and therefore, of course, success is also necessary. And I mentioned already, humor is very important in the high performance culture. So, now I come to the last aspects of my title I was given here, my task, talking about finance and how to put that into this context. Um, well, all what I have shown and said so far applies to any area of the company um, and not to finance in, in specific. For finance and buyer at least, I can say we um, try to manage personnel in a community, so we call it FACT, Finance Accounting Controlling Tax and Audit, you should also, uh, you could also add. And we have said that we, um, that we uh, manage our people abroad by caretakership. So the head of each of those functions is given a number of countries where he or she is then in charge of the people we have abroad. And then I could say that if you ask me what kind of people are we looking for or do we have, so we have of course more the analytical type of folks, um, the ones who are not afraid of numbers. Um, and jobs, I could, let's say, categorize in two families. So we have a very transactional type of jobs, like my foreign exchange manager or my cash manager, um, or in accounting, the accountants, you know, always debit credit must be equal. Um, what they have to do is the quarterly closings. Um, or you have kind of project uh, driven things like M&A, <coughs> like uh, audit, or like corporate finance and so on. So, um, for finance in the narrow sense, so uh, my department, we have 30, uh, 73 staff members in via AG and in total about 200. So we can say we are very centralized in our uh, group, in the buyer group, compared to accounting, where, for example, only 4% are in the corporate center and the rest is uh, distributed around the world or controlling even 3% only central. Um, and my personal motto is quality over cost. So because we have a very small number of high specialists, um, and, but if they do a mistake, it has more or less um, grave con consequences. So that is different from, for example, if I have an accountant for travel expense or accounts receivable or so, if he or she makes a mistake, after three weeks you correct it. Yeah. Um, therefore, um, yeah, my motto is a bit quality over cost here. <coughs> now, two examples, if you would uh, decide to join buyer finance, what could happen with you? 
Um, these are just two examples. I have more. I did not omit any failures. So far, we had never a failure from a trainee joining us. Even if some of them left us, they had good reasons to do so, and they made uh, even a good career after that. But these are two real examples. Dr. Bodenkamp, she studied in Cologne after a bank apprenticeship. She, she joined in 2010, so seven years ago. Today, she is already um, in the upper management level, so this is really, um, let's say, that was a speed career, I would say. Um, she joined in controlling the trainee program, but then found out that controlling was not the thing she liked. And then uh, she joined finance. There she worked as my assistant for yeah, almost one year. Then she joined Capital Markets and Structured Finance in the team as, as a team member and became head of Structured Finance in August 2015. Another example this is even a more um, colorful career. Florian Pach, he um, studied in, in Bavaria and one year in, in the UK. Uh, he joined Bayer in 2005, also as a trainee, in, and then quickly moved to foreign exchange management. So he became a foreign exchange dealer for a couple of years and then moved to Japan to become assistant of the administrative officer of one of our largest business there, of the computer business. He did that for a couple of years and since October 2011 he became a department manager in our real estate company. So we have a subsidiary which deals with our worldwide real estate and he deals for example with questions should we build our own office building in Mumbai, India, or should we rent? Yeah, um, he deals with um, real estate questions in case of acquisitions and so on. So, now comes the question. Only three things. Uh, sir, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is I have just read about you uh, that for establishing a countrywide platform in Germany in the initial years, you stressed for about 12 joint ventures. And uh, uh, my question is how important was that a kind of partnership or some mergers and acquisitions? And how important is merger and acquisition? And is it really required? And second one is that uh, 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 the second question is that uh, in the current scenario of marketing analytics, where Google Analytics and big data analytics are used, uh, what is the stress and what are the scope for an aspirant to aspire for a marketing and financial analytics uh, to focus on those sort uh, with regard to focusing on that aspect or pure strategy? Is it a question about digital? Yeah. Digital, yeah. Okay. So, actually, I wanted to ask you a question, but I will answer your question first. So, um, the importance of joint ventures and the acquisition. So, when we started our business in, in emerging markets, we um, traditionally did that via joint ventures. For example, China is a very prominent example where uh, that Roma mentioned it, we established 12 or in the end maybe 15 joint ventures because we needed partners um, for their relationship with authorities, for their uh, knowledge in society and so on, for acquiring staff members and so on. And we brought the technology. Um, all of those joint ventures in China are meanwhile wholly owned by us or sold or closed. Do we have a close? Um, because, frankly speaking, a joint venture is different from, uh, from a marriage. Yeah, marriage is for life. A joint venture is, let's say, a, 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 it is a get-together of interest for a certain period of time, but then 
one of the two partners traditionally becomes more powerful. Yeah. And I've not seen um, in a joint venture which existed at Bayer longer than 20 years or so. So it's an entrance. Acquisitions, um, we can see here two kinds of acquisitions we did at Bayer. We did so-called transformational acquisitions. Uh, actually, I remember in my career path only one, that was uh, the takeover of sharing in 2006. Big DAX listed German pharmaceutical company. Um, 17 billion euro acquisition, uh, which let's say was very important for our pharmaceutical business. It, it transformed it to another stage. Um, the other one are bold on acquisitions where you um, make small additions on the regional side or on your product portfolio. Um, and I think nowadays um, own R&D and acquisitions and in licensing these are three pillars which, uh, which the development company is, is uh, resting on. But it's not only acquiring, it's also selling or, or IPOing or let go business. So we, we IPO'd last year our material science business, for example, because we, we found out we are not the right owner anymore for that kind of business. And your second question on digital, yes, we, um, we uh, we think that will be very important um, for the future. In the pharmaceutical area, if you think of a network between um, the physician and the patient, so somebody having maybe some device uh, in his body which sends signal to the physician, and then the physician uh, might even enter something in his uh, mobile phone and then some medicine is released from the device into the body. Yeah, um, and we, we can think also of digital applications in crop science. Um, for example, nowadays there are already um, pilots where, um, by a satellite, the field of a farmer is, is photographed or, or let's say surveyed, and the satellite recognizes which part of the land um, needs more fertilizer. Uh, or where you have certain pests in the field, so that the farmer doesn't have to spray the whole field anymore, but, uh, but just the areas where which, which are more, let's say, which should be treated more. Um, so, these are two very, and we have also, uh, um, let's say, a group working uh, on, on digital applications from simple apps, <coughs> um, uh, to this kind of really um, having a network of the, let's say, uh, the spray machine, the farmer drives over his field, satellite and the weather uh, report company and ourselves yeah, put all this together. So, but now, uh, please, could you try to answer my question? So, what, which three things do you need for a great career? 50% of work. Discipline? Discipline is yeah, not I like this. It's pure. Yeah. For me, discipline goes with motivation, so I don't know. Ah, can you work concentrated and motivated? Focus, yeah. Yeah, that's it.
I think uh, for a great career, 50% uh, what you require is your soft skills, 25% is your hard skills, the core competencies, and 25% is sheer luck. Okay. I think that that's one of my, that's the first one which I follow on my list. So, I, because also in the interest of time, I don't want to, uh, to um, this is my personal definition of a great career. So, first of all, you need really to work hard. Yeah, um, and that really I mean like that. So, if if some younger people come to me and they say, "Mr. Miller, we have to speak about work-life balance," I have a certain, you know, uncomfortable feeling. So, um, if you are young and you join a company, you have to work like that. Yeah, um, that's a matter of fact. So hard work, and of course. I think you need all of that in order to have results coming out. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, just to be in the office from, from 7 to 10, and, and I mean here 10 in the evening, um, does not, is not a value in itself. I have no problem if my people go home um, early and they work from home, or if they come at 10 o'clock in the morning, I, I don't mind if they deliver. So, Results are important. Then I think very, very important for a career is that you have superiors which are developing you. So that, that, uh, that you don't have a boss who says, okay, she or she is so good, I don't let her go or him go. That is a, unfortunately still a situation I can see uh, sometimes in our country, which is very unfortunate. And yeah, finally, I think luck. You mentioned that luck and chance. Yeah, really, this is it is as it is. Yeah, you have to be at the right point in time, in in the, in the right slot, in order to get an opportunity. Um, so, for example, when I went to Japan, um, I was actually since one year studying Spanish because uh, in '83. Uh, Brazil was, uh, let's say, the, if you say Kardash means in Germany, so the, the, um, the, the buzzing where the future leaders were taken from. And then uh, my boss one day called me 
and he said, Mr. Miller, would you like to go to Japan? And I said immediately yes, because I was flexible at the time. Uh, so I had to learn Japanese, yeah, and now my wife is Japanese, so, you know, these are chances, as it is, you cannot plan, yeah, you cannot plan this. So, that concludes my presentation, and I would like to remember you that we have also very famous and uh, good Saka club. Um, yeah, and, and I'm still open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And please, your questions. Please, your questions. Are there any questions for this really great insight to my person? Any questions? Any more questions? Please. Oh, sir, as your mission says science for a better life, I want yeah. to know a couple of things about the CSR activities of Bhagat. Yeah. Um, you come from India. Yeah. Um, good example there is uh, child labor. So we had, uh, we had there, frankly speaking, a problem uh, in the past because, um, let's say, part of our business is seeds, and we had farmers growing seeds which we then easily purchased, and uh, farmers employed their children. And then that was uh, recognized by an NGO, and we were nailed against the wall. Um, and then we have turned a problem into an opportunity, and a um, couple of months ago, or one year ago, there was one large page in Frankfurt Allgemeine on our program on Prevent, preventing farmers from employing children. So um, we, we are selecting our farmers very carefully. We are paying, uh, and we have established schools, and so on. So that is, for example, one example. Um, then safety is very important for us. So we are very proud that we have a very low accident rate, which is in a, uh, still, to a certain extent, chemical um, operation very, very important. So safety has a very high uh, value for us. Um, the environment, Bayer is one of the uh, earliest companies in Germany to care for the environment. Um, yeah, and Bayer is a very social company also caring for its people. So for example, uh, the Sucker Club was actually established in uh, 1904 uh, just with players of uh, people who worked in the factory. So it was a cre recreational activity, and today we are still sponsoring more than 100 uh, sports activities with a lot of Olympic medals of uh, um, 
what people we sponsor. Uh, donations, yeah, um, because we are in so many countries, um, we try to develop poor people there, we try to help if there's an earthquake, this kind of thing. Is that enough? Well, we have a report on that, uh, part of our annual report. More questions? I have a question. You told about mentoring yeah. as, a, as an important uh, leadership task. And I think the same. We have in our class emotional intelligence and one of the factors has been mentoring all others. Yeah. And you talked about two mentees. And can you give us some information and some input? How do you coach and manage the mentees in daily practice? Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, um, I have an introduction where the person introduces themselves extensively and also on myself. So because I think you need a very intimate relationship mm -hmm. and you should know the other side very well. Then I ask the person what are your challenges, what, uh, which topics we want to, to discuss. Um, maybe he or she shows me has 360 feedback. We have a look at that. At, uh, we can discuss, let's say, how the superior interacts. Um, and then from that, I develop a step-by-step, step, let's say, an agenda where I say, okay, these are the things I think the person should work on. And then we go, we prioritize it, and, and we establish certain measures. Mm -hmm. And also then uh, we decide how we are going to, to, to measure the success. Yeah. So. It's no rocket science. I think uh, it's really a matter of experience um, and yeah, trustful relationship. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Yeah. We have in uh, we have discussed in West Point that uh, leadership. And we have discussed here all very positive aspects of leadership. Yeah. And there is another aspect of leadership we are uh, discussing in research at the moment: mm -hmm. toxic leadership. Mm -hmm. And do you have any concepts in Bayer to identify toxic leadership yeah. or dealing with toxic leadership? Yeah, for example, we do an employee satisfaction survey uh, every two years, and this is done on a department level. So, for example, for finance, I, uh, this result are uh, um, uh, published also, and um, I think this is a good indicator um, that something is smelly, that something is wrong in the organization, especially if you compare this uh, the two years before and maybe the two years before. So if you see a, a certain trend, yeah. mm -hmm. um, then you, you, you might, let's say, uh, you, you should investigate, let's say. It, it can also be, let's say, if you have a big change management project in that division, and for that reason the result is bad. So it's, it's, but it could be an indicator. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is the most prominent I can now think of. Thank you very much. So, if there are no questions, thank you so much. So, as I told you, I'm interested in getting good people, and I'm sure some here, as there are some of them in the room. I would just uh, draw your attention to our trainee program, which is an 18-month program in this finance economy controlling tax community. You would rotate through these areas, uh, have also an overseas assignment, a uh, short one of course, um, and after that would agree to enter into one of the functions, or you would upfront decide, okay, I enter into one defined function and do some rotation. Um, <coughs> there is one name in the lower right hand side that is Dr. Adrian and this phone number, so and this email. So if you are interested, please apply there. You will get this um, documents after that by Professor Thoma. You can ask 
in the emails and then not send it to me. And we have currently also posted a job advertisement for Germany. So we'd be happy to see maybe some of the other of you there. Thank you very much. Well, yes, thank you very much. So, one moment, one moment. First of all, Mr.